Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all of the earth. The word of the Lord. It's nice to see a new generation, isn't it? Thought I'd show you somebody with some hair to get started. Lighten the mood a little bit. I may have my replacement right there. I don't know. Nice job. Thank you, Colin. We, uh, I started by talking about the weather earlier. Once again, welcome to the house of the Lord, by the way. I noticed this morning, I looked out my window early, the frost on the grass, and where the sun was hitting and where the sun wasn't hitting, the grass is really green. You know what that means? Mowing is coming. I'm not, I really like mowing. I think mowing's really fun. What I'm less happy about, I'm already aware of. The grass isn't ready to mow yet, and I'm already having allergies. Seriously? <clears throat> yes. You know what that means? I can deal with some allergies, because with the allergies comes the promise of warm weather. And if you don't know me, let me tell you, I like me some warm weather. And it's, it's like a tease. It's a little bit of a taste of what's coming. And that's really exciting. That's what I love about all this talk about Easter. Is there's, this, there's this promise of what's coming. And I get really excited about that. There's things to go. In the meantime, though, would we be... Would it be good of us to expect the blessings of God without also the inconveniences? I like the grass. I like mowing grass. It's some of my best prayer time. Because nobody wants to bug me because they know if they come bug me while I'm mowing the grass, I'll just pass it off. <laughs> so <clears throat> I get left alone when I'm mowing the grass. And, uh, but there's all the pollen and there's all of the stuff in the air. And we cannot expect the good without everything else that comes with it. Am I right? We're seeing a fundamental I mean, maybe you've noticed, if you look at the world, things seem like they're not quite right. That's how it's been, right, since the beginning. There's a fall. And for, it seems like, though, maybe you're with me, those of us who have lived more than a little while, and I'm not picking anybody out, I'm going to say me, those of us that have lived a little while may have noticed that things seem to be shifting. Things are a little shifty. Things seem to be shifting a little bit. And I thought about this. Now, this is entirely my idea. So if this is entirely crazy, you know, just move on. I'm telling you this is my idea. It's not based on Scripture. But it is based on something I've noticed in our culture. There used to be, from what I know of, of human history, it used to be that spiritual health was the most important thing in a person's life. Who you worshipped, how you worshipped, that you worshipped, used to be, and I'm talking about a while ago, up until about the Industrial Revolution, what was really important was your spiritual welfare. And if your spiritual welfare was out of whack, it was understood that your life would be out of whack. Anybody know what I'm talking about? None of us were there. Okay, I'm not suggesting that, but I'm just saying like, we know this, right? Since the age of enlightenment, which came around roughly, give me a little latitude, give me, came roughly with the Industrial Revolution, we have shifted radically to where our physical health is the most important thing in our society. Have you noticed this? If you want proof of this, it's real simple. Look what we pay doctors. And how many of us haggle over the price of medical care? 
like that's going to work. How many of us even ask if we go to the dentist or we go to the eye doctor before we check in, what's this going to cost me? Because the people down the street might be cheaper. Anybody do that? Really? Wow, I didn't even know that was a thing. All right, well, forget what I just said then, because actually it does get done. Typically speaking, though, most people that you see in our culture, if you look at what our culture believes and how our culture behaves, your physical health is the most important thing. And we will pay anything to have good, physical, pain-free, physic am I right? Physical health. You've seen this? And now this is, this is just entirely my opinion. So you can dicker with me if you want to. But what I see because of that shift from being focused on our spiritual welfare to being focused on our physical welfare, we have an ec epidemic mental health crisis. That's the way I see it. And you can see it everywhere. Anxiety is like off the charts. And depression and all of these things, which are natural occurrences when things are out of whack. All right? So here's the thing. It seems like as a culture, we will pay anything. We will do anything to prolong our life as if we feel like we should live forever. But what we've lost is what we're living for. And that is causing what I believe, that's entirely my opinion, all right? I believe that's why we are having a mental health crisis in our world is we're working so hard to try to have a pain-free, long life, but our life has no purpose. Am I all by myself on this, or is this making sense to anybody else? I think this is what we're seeing, and it makes me really sad because God has a better plan. And so we see... Because of that, we see a world that's kind of a mess, right? We have issues in life. We have stress, all of us. We have stress. There's disunity. We see division in people. There's doubts about the future. Lots of people lack hope. And what we allow, and I'm talking about as a culture as a whole, but maybe this resonates with you because this resonates with me. We allow our wants and our worries, our desires, and our cravings to compete for the position in our lives that only God can satisfy. And so we keep struggling to try to fill it with something. And maybe if I just feel better, maybe if I just look younger, I'll feel better about myself. Now, friends, there's only so much I can do with this, okay? So that one's a lost cause for me, but do you see, I mean, look, at the products that are on the market to try to defeat aging. When aging is a beautiful, natural process that God built within us, we're not supposed to live forever. And it's good. It's perfect, but yet somehow within us there's this anxiety about it because we don't know what we're living for. And so we live in a culture that is this mess but it's not new. In fact, this has been going on since the Garden of Eden. The specifics look different. The, the manifestations of these emotions and these issues look different. But the root cause of the issue is, is the same. It has always been the same. And we're still seeing it today. We find this illustrated pretty clearly in the book of Malachi. If you've been a regular at the Wednesday night Bible study, you know that we are wrapping up the Old Testament. We are in the last book of the Old Testament, which is the last word on the people of Israel, at least in the Bible. The people of Israel as we knew them, as we have studied them, the book of Malachi wraps it up. The book of Malachi is easy to find, it's short, it's easy to read, and I would postulate, I haven't done an exhaustive research on this, but I would guess it is one of the most, one of the most commonly overlooked Bible books in the Bible. People don't like it. 
And you're about to find out why. <clears throat> so before I get into the book of Malachi, let me remind you, I didn't write the thing. Okay, so moving on. The book of Malachi. The, just to make sure that we're on the same page, the people of Israel... At the time the book of Malachi was written, have been through a lot. All right? They have been enslaved. From the beginning of their lifetime, they have been enslaved. They wandered in the desert for 40 years. They had lived through a line of lousy judges. They had a whole string of bad kings. They had enemy occupation. They have lived through exile to a foreign country. They have lived through rebuilding, returning and rebuilding to their own nation, which had been completely decimated by their enemies. They had seen a lot of heartaches throughout the history of the people of Israel. They had seen a lot of heartache. And they also had seen a very faithful God who had blessed them and refused to let them go even when they had turned their backs on him, when they had rejected him and denied him. God had always been faithful. So by the time Malachi comes along and he's written, the exile's over, the remnant has returned, and they have rebuilt the temple, they've rebuilt the city wall in Jerusalem, and they've started worshiping. And then time passed. And that's always what gets us in trouble, isn't it? When you look at, when you read any history lesson, our problem is when time passes. We get things all set. And then you get a couple generations, and a couple generations change, and each generation slips a little bit. We pay a little bit less attention. So by the time Malachi is writing his book, the people are still worshiping. That's in parentheses, lowercase w. They're still going through the motions, all right? But they're not being faithful. They're going through the motions because they could be taught. They've learned through the past, about everything I just told you about, that if you do not worship God and you say, I don't want God, I am rejecting God, I want nothing to do with God, God will say, okay, and you will get life without God. And I think all of us probably at some point in our lives have lived a little bit life without God, and it really stinks. They've gotten what they've asked for. So now what the people are doing is... They're still going through the motions. But they're not actually worshiping God. And so that's what the book of Malachi is all about. How to be faithful to, be worship, to worship God for more than just the blessings that he gives. Because what they're doing, they're just going through the motions to make sure that he doesn't let another foreign country occupy them and beat them all up real bad. But that's not the point, all right? So here comes Malachi. The word Malachi, his name means my messenger. That's a clue. We're getting a message directly from God. And Malachi brought a letter that is directly from God. It is not a letter that brings a verdict of judgment. It's not a letter that is telling them that they're going to be punished. It's not a letter telling them that they're bad or lousy people. It's actually a letter of encouragement. It's actually a really nice, warm letter. It's a good letter. But it does tell them that they're not being faithful. And we have learned through human history that people don't like being told they're not being faithful. So God lays it out in a way that is actually really kind and really gentle. He uses here a literary device called imagined disputation, which is kind of fun. Um, we see it in other places in the Bible, but not quite as obvious as we do in Malachi. It projects an argument of dialogue between God and the people. And God, so the way it works, God names an issue that the people are experiencing, and then God asks a question on their behalf. So he knows a question that they have in their head, so he goes, and, he goes ahead and asks it, and then he answers the question. Okay? So to give you an example to that, uh, I could say, we're, we're hosting Cars and Coffee here next week. And you say, why are you hosting Cars and Coffee here next week? And I say, because we love our neighbors. And let's be honest, a bunch of us are kind of 
gearhead, lug nuts, and we like to have cool cars around. So why not bring those things together and we will show a little love to our community and invite people to worship with us. You see what I did there? I went a little long with the end, but you get the idea. Like God proposes a question that he assumes the people are asking. And then he answers his question. All right? So it's kind of a nicer way of bringing about getting them to the point of what he wants them to understand. So the text goes through a series of these imagined disputes. And he covers a whole bunch of issues that need to be fleshed out so that the people will understand why their life is so cruddy. Because they don't understand why things are so hard. Anybody ever been there? You just wonder, why is life so hard? In fact, I said that this morning. I'm just admitting that to you. So, like, why is life so hard? People can't figure this out. And so this book deals with a whole bunch of things, like the people don't believe that God loves them anymore, so he deals with that. There's disputes over false and fake spiritual practices, breaking faith in relationships, uh, a lack of judgment, and so on. So collectively, when it all gets together, the book of Malachi addresses everything that the people are feeling at that time. Because these people are living, feeling overwhelmed, and they're feeling like they've been forgotten by God. And Malachi explains why. That's what the book of Malachi is all about, all right? That's all the academia behind it. Now, let's see what he actually says. You ready? This is everybody's favorite book right here. Malachi, chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I, this is God speaking, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Okay, so the people have been waiting. The people have been wandering. The people have been wondering, why is life so hard? Why does life seem so empty? Why? What is missing? This is, these are questions they're asking. Why are they not experiencing God in the same way that their forefathers did? Why are they not seeing the blessings of God that their forefathers did? And as an answer to this, he starts with an assurance that the Lord will come. I will send my messenger, prepare the way. Then the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. Yes! This is good news, right? Well, then there's verse 2. So just roll with me over to verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. In short, he's reminding them before he gets there, remember who God is. And of all the ways to describe God, God is holy, God is perfect, God is strong, God is mighty. We could go on all day listing the things about God. But the reason he points this out, who can endure the day of his coming? What he's saying is, who is holy enough to stand before the Lord? Zip. Nobody is holy enough to stand before the Lord. And he goes on and he says, he will be like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. In other words, if you want to be holy, things are going to, things are going to get warm. You know how you purify gold? You get it really hot. There's two messages there. One, things are probably going to get pretty hot. However, gold will be purified. It can be done. And when you're done, it's perfect and blameless without blemish. So if you keep your eye on the prize, then it's worth going through the fire. Do you follow me? If you have a goal, see, this is the problem. This is what I started with. We have no purpose. But if you figure out what your purpose is, it makes going through the fire 
worth it. You follow me? So in short, the Lord is coming. He's going to come take out the trash. He's going to clean things up, and he's going to gather the people who are waiting for him. This is really good news for those who want that. For those who are in rebellion, this is terrifying news. This is not good news. All right? So let's move on to verse 5. So I will come to you and put you on trial. Okay, that doesn't sound good. Now, insert, we're going to skip over them because for the sake of time. But he says, I will put you on trial. And he makes this whole list of offenses that they have committed against God. And then it gets to the point that's really cool. He says, so I will put you on trial, but do not fear me. Everything in the Bible says fear me, except this. It's one of the things I really like about the book of Malachi. He said, don't fear me. I will. He says, do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Let's remember, let's recap. He promised the children of Abraham, the children of Isaac, the children of Jacob, these people, that he would be their God forever. He promised them that. All right? Now, he promised them that, but he didn't promise them that he would be cool with everything they ever do. That's what this is all about. Don't fear me. I will still be your God. I will still provide for you. I will still take care of you. However, you cannot continue living in rebellion against me. I will not destroy you, but we are going to get this, this relationship right. That's what he's saying. We're going to right this relationship one way or the other. And he's basically saying to them, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. But one way or the other, this is happening. All right? Which is good. So then we still have it on the board, I think, verse 7. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from the decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, says the Lord, and I will return to you. In other words, there is no drifting too far. There is no going so far from God that he will not let you come back. This is good news. This is good news. He says, return to me and I will return to you. All right? Now, this is when the, dis the, the imagined dispute starts. I know you've been anxiously waiting for this part of the scripture. So here we are. This is where the dispute starts. And the next piece of scripture, it rolls over, says, but you ask... How are we to return to you? And God answers, Will a mere mortal rob me? Yet you rob me. But you ask, How are we robbing you? And God answers, In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, you and your whole nation, because you are robbing me. That's the answer to the question. When it says you are under a curse, this is the answer to your question right there. Why is life so hard? Because you are robbing God. Not that God is punishing you for robbing him. God is just letting you have life the way you ask for it. You say you don't want God? Okay, fine. Then God won't be there for you. Boom. But he says, return to me and I will return to you. You are robbing me. The word tithe here literally means tenth. Okay? Okay. You are robbing me in tithes and offerings. A tenth. This concept, I don't have slides for it, just trust me. You can go back and look it up. In Leviticus chapter 27, he lays out the idea of the tithe. It's a tenth. And for the people in Leviticus, for the Levites, it was in basically a tenth of everything. It was a tenth of your time, it was a tenth of your talent, and a tenth of your treasure. Bring a tenth, give it to God. That's what it literally means, a tenth of everything. And what it's, it's saying is, you offer these things back to God in gratitude for what you've been given. Now, this word rob right here, this is not a nice word. In English, it's not a nice word. In Hebrew, it's a super nice, not nice word. This is not like, okay, I left the restaurant and I forgot to leave a tip for my waitress rob which is bad don't do that okay 
But <laughs> it's not that. This is more like smash in a window and take stuff off a car seat parked on the side of the road, somebody you don't know. Rob. All right? Is there anybody in here disagree that that would be the wrong thing to do? I hope not, because we need to have more conversation. All right? Flip it over. If somebody smashes in your car window and takes all of your stuff out of it when you're not there. Sorry, is it too soon? I forgot that happened. All right, let's get off that subject. All right, so we agree that taking other people's stuff, actually the best example I can think of on the fly, and keep in mind this is a metaphor, so it does break down, all right? The best example I can think of to what God is telling us would be like not paying for your mortgage. All right, think this through, all right? The bank has already given you the money to buy a place to live, and you're living there. You're living it up. You're warm, and you have your stuff everywhere, and you sleep well at night because you have your home. But if you don't repay the bank for what they've given to you, you had an agreement. So you're robbing the bank because you're living on their money and not living up to your side of the bargain, which is little small installments. Now, don't follow it too far, because I realize once you pay your mortgage, it becomes... It, but anyway, you follow what I'm saying in the short term. Is this, like, running? That's kind of what God is saying to them. You're robbing me. You're not giving back to me what you agreed, what we had agreed upon. Okay? So, you're, and he uses that word, and the word is strong, and the word is shocking. And I think it's shocking on purpose because they don't seem to see the problem here. And so he's trying to rattle their cage. That's the point. If you look at verse 10, he shows them how to fix the problem. He said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And this is the most shocking thing of all. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I do not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Where else in the Bible does God say, test me on this? You can flip through if you want to, but let me help you. It doesn't happen. In fact, it's pretty clear. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Those are the words of Jesus. And yet, God himself says, put me to... Now, underline this in your Bibles. He says, test me in this. Okay, very specific. Test me about this issue. All right? And see if I cannot be trusted with this. I was talking to a buddy of mine this week, hadn't seen for a long time, and he said something shocking to me. He has grown children. They're, like, not quite flying on their own yet, but they, like, live on the edge of the nest. They're, they're like, in their late teens, early 20s. He charges them rent to live in his house. Now, they're not in high school anymore. They have jobs. All right, so those of you, like, don't get ideas just yet, but... Um, <laughs> He charges them rent to live in the house. And he gives them privileges because they charge rent. Like there are responsibilities that you would put on your dependent who's just living in your house that you wouldn't put on a renter, right? There's certain things that you would not expect. And there are certain things of a renter that you expect that you would not expect of your children. You follow me? So I heard this, I'm like, really? You charge your kids rent to live in your house. And then he kept talking. And he said, well, what you need to understand, he said, I have accounts set up. And all the rent that they give me, I put in this account that's in their name. But they don't know that. They think they're paying me rent. But actually what I'm doing is I'm saving for them. So when they want to buy a house or when they need to set themselves up in life and they need a big chunk of money that would be really hard for them to have, there it is, all right? That actually is a closer picture of what tithing is. We give to God what we think is ours, and we think it's really hard to give this up, but actually it's storing up for us a relationship. It's creating a relationship of trust where we have full trust in the Lord and we don't have to worry so much about the future. Does that make sense? It's actually kind of a beautiful thing. 
And so I kind of wondered why I didn't think of it. Because this guy's a lot smarter than me, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's God, this relationship we have with God, it's not about the money with God. It's about the relationship with God. Because we will get to, friends, I hate to bring this up. We will see moments in our lives. If you haven't already, God bless you, that's wonderful. But we will see moments in our lives when you will need to have a relationship with God already established. And there will not be time to fix it then. That's what tithing does. Tithing builds this trust with God. So when you have absolutely nothing else that you can rely on, you know you can rely on God. That's what this does. And he says, test me on this, which is the point I'm trying to make. You test something in advance to see if it works. Right? He says, test me on this. It's the only place in the Bible. Tithing is about trusting God fully. In fact, he not only expects us to test him on this, he encourages us to test him on this. It's the only place. It's, it's, to, it's about totally throwing ourselves on God, and he will totally throw himself into us. That's what he's saying. When you rely upon God in desperation, you develop a relationship with him that cannot be compared with any other relationship. It puts things in perspective. A little while ago, Colin read Psalm 96, 8 and 9. It says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. In English, this is broken down. They put it in a chapter verse. When they put the verses, it breaks in the middle. But in Hebrew, that's one continuous thought. All right? That's not two different ideas. That's one continuous thought. The act of tithing is an act of worship. Just like singing, just like listening to messages, just like Bible study. Praising God. Tithing is the same thing. It illustrates the place that God has in your life. It says, ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. Do you think he doesn't know who he is? Do you think God needs us to tell him how great he is? Do you think God needs us to reflect his glory back to him so that he knows how glorious he is? Let me help you. We don't have that kind of influence. We also don't have that kind of responsibility. What it is, the one who is being proven, is you. We prove it to ourselves that God is worthy by testing him on this. We, we give our praise, we give our worship, and we see that he is worthy because we do it. If you don't do it, you won't know. Like so many things in life, if you don't do it, you won't know. All right, like, like the basketball players over here, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. <laughs> Try it. That's what he's saying. Try it out. Give it, see what happens. Prove it to yourself completely. Back to Malachi chapter 3, verse 11. I think this is really cool. Verse 11. He says, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. What did that just say? Pests and crops? I don't have crops. The only crop I have is grass. Well, that's not really true. Probably the bumper crop that we have at our house is pollen. We grow a killer crop of pollen in my house every year. What's he talking about? The Lord, if you test God in tithing, the Lord might give you more money. Probably not, though. Most of the time, what this is saying, if you trust God with a small portion of what he's already given you, he will make what's left go farther. He will keep it from being wasted. He will make it more effective. It will make it more efficient. It will make it produce more. He'll just make what you already have better. And I can talk all day. You don't want me to get started telling you how this has worked in my life. With silly things like cars and a whole variety of bills, like cars that needed all kinds of work, and we just 
God just provided so that that didn't have to happen. Bills and things that we didn't have any idea how we were going to pay for. And God just provided in ways that we could have. There's no other explanation. All right. That's what God does. He makes he makes what we have more productive. At least that's what he says in Malachi. All right. And so he promises to bless us beyond our imagination. Maybe with money, maybe not. More than likely, though, he will bless you with peace and a provision that cannot be bought with money. You can't buy peace with money. In fact, most of the stuff we buy with money disturbs our peace. Am I right? Most of the stuff we buy with our money disturbs our peace. God will give us peace. And you will find, or at least I have certainly found, I'm giving you my personal witness on this, when God is trusted, you always have more than enough. You may not have as much as you thought you wanted, but you'll always have more than enough. Now, people will say, keeping this disputed argument going, people say, that's Old Testament. That's out of date. Well, Luke says in Luke 6, 38, given it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In other words, if you're stingy, stingy is what you'll get. God will never ask you, if you're struggling with this right now, I'm trying to perceive what you might be thinking when you're hearing this. If you're struggling with this right now, God will never ask you to give what he hasn't given you. Okay? That's, the, that's totally against the principle of the tithe. God will not ask you to give what you don't have. What he asks is that we trust him completely with what you do have. All right. So if you're not tithing, if you're not trusting God with your physical resources, you're missing the fullness of life and peace and grace that God wants you to have when you trust him and try him out on this. Now, one of the chief criticisms of the church, universal, all churches, is that the church is just trying to get my money. All right. And Maybe you're thinking that. I don't know. That, that actually has been well earned throughout the course of history, and I'm embarrassed by that, frankly. But if you're thinking that I'm trying to get your money, you haven't heard anything that I've said today. So let me say a couple things differently, all right? If you're thinking the church is after my money, let me remind you of something. You are the church. Let that sit for a minute. The church is you. The church is the people. Everything about the church is you. Every brick in this building, everything that's in this building, every ministry that that, that comes out of this local church, every time that door opens and somebody goes in or out, it is a reflection of the relationship you have with God. And if we're stingy with God, the world will see that we are stingy with God. And then God will be stingy with us. It reflects to the world your attitudes. Whatever your attitude about money happens to be is a reflection about your attitude with God. If money is the most important thing to you, then that shows that you have money higher than God. And God's already told us what he thinks about that. All right, now, if you're still not convinced that I'm not just after your money. Let me say something that's probably going to make every church treasurer on earth's head explode. All right? I'm going to step out here so you can see my eyes when I say this. All right? I did not say that you must tithe to this church. Hopefully you understand the credibility that I'm, I'm being very transparent with you here. You need to trust God with your money. And you need to ask God what to do with your money. Of course, it'd be great. We have things here that we need. 
But I'm not asking. I'm not trying to get in your pockets. I want to be very, very clear. I am not asking you for your money. I am asking you to trust God with what he has given you, however he says to do it. Don't put me in this. All right? <laughs> Don't hear me giving you a message that's all about me and what I want. Unless what you're hearing is I want you to trust God with everything you have. You follow me? God will take care of this church. He always has. He shows up in ways that we didn't see coming. <laughs> and he provides for things. We had no idea how it was going to happen. And he just does it. All right? My point is, all of us need to trust God with all of us. The issues in your heart. Now, another thought that I want to remind you of, this is probably a little out of place, but I forgot to mention it earlier. There's not a single thing. Think about this a minute. Just think about this a minute. There is not a single thing on this earth that you can buy with money that you're going to be able to keep. Nothing. It's either going to rust, rot, or burn or you're going to eat it, and we won't talk about that. There is nothing <laughs> that you can buy with money that you get to keep. All right? All of it one day goes away. But if you don't trust God with your money, which he ultimately gives to you anyway, how can you trust him with things that really do matter? Things like your health and your kids and your future and the world that we live in is such a mess. What about your marriage? How about knowing what your purpose in life is? How are you going to trust him with those things that really matter if you won't even trust him with your money, which is all going to rust, rot, and burn? I don't know. Can you understand? How, can you hear me passionate on this? I'm a little, like, I didn't want to tell you. I didn't write this, okay? I, I mean, I wrote this, but I didn't write this. This is the heart of God. Tithing, let me be clear on this too. Tithing does not create a relationship with God. It's not like you're buying a relationship with God. You understand that, right? If I said this in a way that that's clear, it's not about that, all right? Tithing simply releases your death grip on all of your stuff so that the world, from this world, so that Jesus can move into your heart and really radically change your life. I mean that. If all you think about and worry about and what keeps you awake at night is your money, stay awake at night thinking about God and trusting God to take care of whatever your problem with money happens to be. And you will find your life is far more peaceful than that, than it is, all right? Tithing doesn't buy a relationship, it fulfills the relationship. It's not about getting to God, it's about, getting, it's about letting God get to you. So often our attitudes about money build a wall that keep God from fully being able to bless us. Because we won't grab on to God, we want to hold on to our money. My money. So, he's waiting for you to invite him. It's about God getting to you and about letting your life become whole. I'm going to wrap up with this reminder. All right, this is basic reminder for us. God created everything. God has everything. It's all his, including you and me. He created it all, and he created us to be with him. He doesn't want anything between us and him. Our sin separated us from that relationship, the relationship that he wants us to have with him. We chose to deny that. Each one of us have done that. That's our nature, but it's also our choice. We have all chosen one way or another not to do that. Our sins cannot be undone by good deeds. You can't do enough good deeds to fix what's broken. All right? Good deeds only mask them. It's like putting frosting on a burnt cookie. It looks pretty on the outside, but death is still on the inside. 
all right? Only a sacrifice of life can bring life. And those of us that are dead in our transgressions cannot sacrifice life to bring life. Jesus had to do that. And he did. That's what Jesus did on the cross at Easter, which we're about to celebrate. He brought new life for us. Everyone who trusts in him alone will be saved from the punishment of sin. Everyone who trusts in him alone with everything, including, believe it or not, yes, your money, And then life starts over. In God's eyes, it's like your past, your mess-ups, your mistakes, your regrets, your hang-ups, your failures, they're all gone. In God's eyes, it starts over. Do not, friends and neighbors, do not let an unhealthy attitude about worldly possessions get in the way between you and the life that God has for you. I'm going to say it one more time. I am not after your money. What I want is for all of us in here to have, and all of us in there, to have a fully devoted, abandoned relationship with God and see how he will fulfill his promises to open the floodgates and wash us away with his mercy and grace. Is that something you want? Because that's what I want. That's what I want for you and for me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. Even the parts of your word that I don't like, they were given to us as a gift to open our hearts to you. It's not about opening God's heart to us. It's always open. It's about opening our heart to God. Lord, I pray that, we, that your word has been heard in a way that resonates within us. I pray that you're speaking to us in a way that cannot be mistaken and cannot be misunderstood, but also in a way that cannot be overlooked. God, I pray that you will grab onto us with your truth that's in your word and change us. It's between each person and the heart of God. I pray that you're seeking that today, and I pray that you will be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to play.